Hi, folks. Um, thank you and welcome uh, for today's webinar. Uh, I'm Ed Korea, founder and president of Sagason Technologies. And today's webinar is about how to perform an IT audit. Um, before we get started, I do realize that most people joining us today are probably not technical experts. So I'm going to try very hard not to talk over people's heads, uh, share too many technical terms. Um, in other words, I'm going to try to keep the techno babble to a minimum. Uh, this webinar is actually a class designed for do-it-yourselfers or the DIY crowd. Uh, all registrants to this webinar should have received their own uh, how to perform an internal IT audit uh, document, um, uh, do-it-yourself guide. I, I strongly encourage you to pull out that guide now and take notes as we go along. Um, I do know that at times I talk a bit fast. I will try and slow down. Um, but that will help quite a bit. Uh, let's see. Oh, asking questions. Uh, in the control panel for the webinar, you'll see an area where you can uh, ask questions. I'm probably not going to entertain most questions during the webinar. Sorry, but it's too many things to keep track of. Uh, but that shouldn't stop you from asking questions as we move along. If I do see something that's simple, uh, and can fit in, I'll, I'll address it during the webinar, but more than likely, I'll save most questions until the end. Okay, thank you very much, here we go. So our agenda today is to walk you through the eight steps that we use here at Sagason Technologies to perform an IT audit. Um, there's a lot of reasons to perform IT audits, and I'm going to address that later. Uh, but an IT audit, the way we've described it here, is really just the very beginning of the journey of understanding your environment. Uh, but I will cover all eight steps, uh, one through eight. Um, and let's get going. So first off, uh, I'm going to give you two slides about Sagason. That's it. The rest of it is all informational. Uh, but a little bit about myself and my company, Sagason Technologies. Um, in some ways, it seems like I've always been doing IT. Uh, this is my 41st year in IT, and Sagason is now 18 and three quarter years into this business. Um, time really flies. Uh, technology flies even faster. It seems that every two to three years, we're facing something very, very new. Uh, I have been flattered to be recognized uh, with a couple industry awards. Actually, I've gotten a few, but the only two that I put on here was the Channel Pro 2020 Visionary Awards that were awarded to the top 20 visionaries in IT. Um, this happens every year. I was lucky enough to be uh, recognized in 2015 and 2016. I was also recognized in uh, 2013 through 2016 as one of the top 250 uh, IT people in the industry by MSP, MSP Mentor. Sagacent, my company, uh, has been privileged to be acknowledged uh, several times. Uh, we've been a member of the MSP Mentor 501, which is a list of the top 501 managed service providers on the planet uh, for the last six years, 2013 through 2018. Uh, and we also made the MSP Mentor 501 Small Business Edition uh, in the years 2013 through 2018. Um, pretty, we're pretty lucky, uh, very flattered, uh, very honored to be included in such lists with such important people. A uh, little bit about my company, Sagason Technologies. We were founded in, well, actually January 1 of 2000. Uh, Sagason had been a dream of mine for a long time. Uh, today, we are a leading technology solution provider here in Silicon Valley. We focus on small and mid-sized businesses uh, very, with a great emphasis on professional service firms. And we offer our clients a full range of solutions in the area of technology management service. Uh, this is the core of our business, contract-based, fixed fee, all-you-can-eat business IT support. Uh, we also do infrastructure support services where we're on call and you can use us when you need us. Um, we are actually called in quite a bit 
to do audits and assessments for IT teams. Uh, this usually is common for small and mid-market firms uh, that don't have quite the experience or they just want an objective uh, second party to come in and look at things and tell them what's what. Um, strategic technology consulting is when we come in and we assist with the planning, budgeting, or strategy around IT because IT really needs to be mapped to the plans of the business and where they're trying to go. Uh, too often I see IT as just being, it just exists, it's just there. IT needs to be there to further the business goals. Uh, that's why we exist. And of course we do some solution development services, network design, custom database development, and access or SQL. That's a little bit about us and the rest of this will be of an educational nature. So. Our agenda today is to talk a little bit about what I consider to be extremely crucial network audits. As I suggested earlier, um, I think that network audits are just the tip of the iceberg uh, because after an IT audit, you may branch off into different areas. You may look and do a specific security audit. You may decide that you want to do a disaster recovery plan. There's a whole bunch of other audits and plans and things that all spawn from the seed, which is network audits. But I'm here to teach you some tips and tricks of the trade uh, to really seeing your network, sometimes for the first time. Uh, information technology has become the lifeblood of most businesses today. It's, it's required not only to conduct business, to store the data, connect the business to the internet and cloud resources, but also to protect that business from attacks. And it must be resilient enough to withstand key systems failing uh, and ensure that the normal business operations can resume quickly. Uh, an IT audit helps facilitate all this stuff because we're able to start with a map of what we want to do. Periodic network assessments, uh, and a well-maintained documentation are essential in maintaining a healthy network environment. They provide the accurate information for you uh, that you need to make smart decisions and make it sure that you're focusing on the right things. They help avoid surprises and they provide early warnings to hidden problems or issues that may be lurking on the horizon. Uh, it is rare where we conduct a network audit where we don't find something that we weren't expecting. And that's even when we're managing networks. Things change. Sometimes the people of the company go and change the network, uh, unbeknownst to the IT people. So these are important. Uh, most importantly, an IT assessment provides you with that map or ba baseline to forecast for future network changes and new technology implementations. In addition, you can use the assessment report and the consultation uh, with you know business owners, decision makers to develop contingency plans and identify network weaknesses and vulnerabilities. A, a, a conversation really has to happen with the ownership of the firm or, and the decision makers about how how crucial is it that we be resistant to ransomware? How crucial is it that we have fault tolerance against this and this and this system failing? Um, so often the network audit is that launching pad to having some information for those conversations. Um, true IT management is much more than fixing things after they break. It requires round the clock monitoring, management and maintenance, all with the goal of having highly efficient systems, very productive employees, secure data, and compliance with any regulations that might uh, affect a given business. Here at Sagacent, uh, we regularly perform network audits on our clients. Uh, I like to perform one at a minimum of once a year on each client. Um, but other kinds of network audits could be uh, security audits, uh, compliance audits for things like HIPAA, PCI, GDPR, and others. Uh, today, I'm, I'm going to walk you through it in a very layman's level uh, through the logic of a standard network assessment. This is only the beginning or starting place. After an audit comes the creation of the IT plan, uh, but that's going to be at another webinar in the future. Step number one, the IT documentation. Um, 
the this is, is fasten your seatbelt, folks, because this is really uh, the hardest slide in the whole group. Uh, IT documentation is where it all begins. Um, I can remember years before where I used to grab a yellow pad and walk around and document things. Um, and it was very simplistic. Today's networks, 41 years later, <laughs> are, they are much, much more complex. Uh, and it's going to require often software or tools, uh, certainly spreadsheets, uh, to record all the things that are in a network. Uh, but, you know, you're going to want to be recording the hardware assets at the environment, the software assets, information about the licensing. I'm going to come back to network topology in a minute. Uh, administrative credentials, users, uh, what access rights those users have, who are the key vendors, and hopefully a disaster recovery plan, which frankly becomes its own document unto itself. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to do network topology and come back to that is it's often confusing. Uh, here's an example of a network topology I did back in 2007. Uh, I have uh, tried to omit certain data from it, so you're going to see some breaks in the lines and things like that. Uh, but a network topology is a logical diagram of your environment. Uh, you don't want to capture every mouse, every printer. You want to do, you want to get the uh, major things. So like in the area here where I've got six desktops, I will tell you that that company had a lot more than just six desktops. Um, I'm capturing the major elements. Also, uh, network topology is typically designed from a top down or left to right schema. So you're going, you're watching the access to the network flowing from the cloud through a router, through a firewall, maybe to a switch, getting distributed to other devices and things like that. But a network topology is so very invaluable. Um, I equate it almost as crucial to all the other documents that you're going to gather. The documents you're going to gather in this IT audit um, will serve you well, but quite honestly, the network topology is the kind of thing that you can pull out in front of a business executive and use it to walk them through the environment so that they can understand it. Really crucial. Okay, next, checking the internet connection. Um, the internet connection has, these days, is now absolutely important. Um, we want to be noting the down speed, the up speed, how these things uh, compare or uh, or how they compare against the baseline. For example, uh, here at Sagacent, I have a certain speed from my internet provider, uh, and that's what I'm paying for. Am I getting that? I wouldn't know if I didn't periodically test it. Uh, so here at Sagacent, I run a test once a month against and to, to determine our upload and download speeds. I want to make sure that things are working as they should. Uh, typically, when I'm doing a test, I might run that test three times to get an aggregate. And if I see something getting a little weird, I might say, OK, I'm going to run this test tomorrow and see if it's still weird, because that can tell you very quickly if something has gone wrong. Uh, we had a client site where we, we do the, did this test for, and we actually found out that a employee had set up a server, unbeknownst to us, uh, and was doing some naughty things on it. And he was consuming a vast amount of the client's network. Uh, if we had not been running the network connection speed test periodically, we might not have seen that. Um, frankly, in, in the, those days when we found this, uh, we didn't have the sophisticated tools we have today that'll tell us about different information flowing on networks. Uh, now we do, but I still think it's a great idea to, you know, check the performance against what you expect to see. The third bullet there where I'm talking about redundancy or failover, that comes to the idea of how crucial is the internet to us and our operations. If you're, I've got a lot of medical firms as clients, um, and very often their record keeping is in the cloud, it is absolutely critical that their internet be up all the time or they can't record information about clients or access information. So 
in those cases, having a redundant or a failover internet makes sense. Typically, it's going to require another piece of hardware to facilitate with that. Um, we'll often have a primary internet connection at a client that they're expecting to use that's got the fat pipe, the high bandwidth, and maybe a very low performance, uh, inexpensive secondary internet connection. So when that primary goes down, the systems can be configured to automatically fail over to the secondary. Um, I actually don't mind it too much when I get a complaint from a client saying, our internet's really slow. And we go look at it, we go, mm-hmm, the primary connection is down, they're still able to operate, good news, we did, a, we did a good job, we put that redundant system in place. But conversations have to happen with management to understand you know, how crucial is that internet connection, does it have to be up all the time? Step three, what does the networking infrastructure look like? At a high level, we're talking about the network switches, the cabling, the wireless that's in place. This stuff changes over time. Uh, when I first started in IT, I mean, 10 megabits per second was a really great speed. And I can remember when we got upgraded and 100 megabit switches were possible. Oh boy, that's great. And then gigabit, and now we've got clients running you know, 10 gig and higher. Um, technologies change. You need to be very familiar with your environment and be looking at the equipment that's out there and determine uh, if it still fits the need. Especially in switches, we are constantly finding what's called shadow IT, uh, where some employee thought it was wise to put in his own switch for his own needs, um, and they can do things where they create a loop back or a network storm and take down the network or severely hamper the performance of that network. Also, they tend to think that a switch is a switch is a switch and not be thinking about speeds. And uh, many times we've had situations where people are complaining at us because we did something wrong only to find out that some employee plugged in their own little switch in an area and they put in a 10100 or something and just about hobbled the network. Uh, cabling today, you know, we're using Cat5, Cat5e, Cat6. Uh, so that's good, but you need to look at the cabling. Um, periodically, at least a couple times a year, we'll go into an environment and find out that they're still running some ancient dinosaur like Cat 3. No lie, we've seen that. <laughs> uh, we've also found the people who, in their wisdom, decided to split the Ethernet cable so that they could run more connections across them, uh, only not realizing it destroyed the performance of the network. Uh, wireless is one of those things that's constantly changing. Um, Newer computers, particularly laptops, are coming out with new speeds. And we'll go into environments and all the computers are capable of, you know, 800 megabits per second or something, and yet the wireless access points max out at 100 or sometimes less. So you have to be very familiar with your environment and periodically walking around and noting all this in an audit is really important. Understanding servers. Uh, this is one of those things where I like to build a spreadsheet uh, and record everything in a big table. But you're going to want to get to know every server, whether it's physical or virtual. Um, I count a server is the operation of an operating system. If it's an operating system running, it's a server. So more often today, we're seeing virtual servers, many of them, running on a single host or physical server, you need to go out and record it. By that, we want to capture the name of the server, what's the role of the server, when it was deployed, really important, when it was deployed. Um, the operating system, and what's the revision of that operating system? Often there are service packs and updates that can be done. What's it running? What should it be running? Uh, what are the key applications on that server? Um, do those key applications fit the role of the server? Uh, what are the security measures we're taking for that server? I don't know why, but I keep running into offices where, for whatever reason, all security has been disabled on a given server. Ridiculous. Um, security has to be in place everywhere. You might change the security, but you never turn it off. And we keep finding servers where all the security is off. <laughs> um, what's the backup 
and strategy plan should that server go down? Um, how are we backing up the data? And if it crashes and burns, what are we going to do to get it back? That's really important. Uh, support agreements. Often, again, this goes back to the age of the machine. Uh, I don't like to have any servers in operation that are not under the warranty with the original manufacturer. Um, if that server goes down, I have to get parts fast. Um, and so we want to record what are the support agreements? Is it under warranty? Uh, given the software that's on there, uh, is it licensed legally? Um, you know, how old is it? So be thinking about all those kind of things. Support agreements also extend to if you have outside IT support uh, for that equipment, you want to record that. Uh, dual power supplies basically is kind of like the redundant internet connections. Uh, I don't like to deploy a server unless there's at least two power supplies. Power supplies fail. Um, a secondary power supply is inexpensive, so you've got one the primary running and the secondary on standby. Uninterruptible power supplies are crucial. Um, we actually had a client very recently uh, who had had a number of power issues at their facility, and we found out that the uninterruptible, uninterruptible or the UPS was not configured appropriately, so it was not gracefully shutting down the server. So if the power went on too long and, the, and it exhausted the batteries in the UPS, uh, it would just crash the server and lead to corrupted data. Major mistake. Uh, every server has to be protected by batteries, uh, and those should be configured to gracefully shut down the server if the power gets, uh, if the time without power gets to too close to the maximum length of the batteries within those UPSs. Similarly, UPSs are, are very important to protect a server from power fluctuations, things like power spikes or drops in power, we call brownouts. Um, these things can shorten the life of a server dramatically. So, and, and, and UPSs are much cheaper than servers, so protect every server. Desktops and laptops, similar to what we just talked about in gathering data for the servers, we want to gather data on every desktop and laptop. We want to look for the device name, who's the user assigned to that device, when was it deployed or manufactured, uh, what's the operating system, what's the revision of the operating system, does it have any service packs, is it missing anything. Um, key applications that are running, uh, very often we'll find that half the applications on a computer have no business being on that computer because they're not really helping the business. They're not business endorsed apps. Um, they're just things that users put on there. Some companies allow that, other companies don't. Uh, during the audit, you want to find out what's there and check with management and find out if that's okay. We want to look at the security measures, I'm going to talk about this more in a moment, that are being used to protect that computer. How are we encrypting hard drives in this organization? Are we using two-factor authentication uh, to, to force users to log in more securely? What's the backup plan, if there is any, for backing up the data on these machines? And is there a plan such that if the computer failed, that we could get access to other computers quickly and protect that user so they could continue to work? Again, we also want to look at the support agreements. Is the device under warranty? Uh, do we have contracts with other support vendors to take care of those in some way? Endpoint security, it's one of my favorite things. Um, and the little cloud here we put in about, you know, endpoint security referring to the methodology or how we're going to protect desktops, laptops, even mobile devices. Um, there is no right way to do this, there's just gradations along the path, the, the path to becoming more secure. Uh, often what worked last year or the year before is insufficient this year. So this is something we always have to be look at, looking at. It starts with software patches and updates. I hate it when I see people just setting windows, for example, to automatically update and then they have no visibility into what's happening. I think it's absolutely crucial since half the patches out there uh, are there to fix problems in the operating system and, and make better compatibility and functionality, but the other half 
are there to fill holes or vulnerabilities that have been identified in the operating system and programs. And very often when we go in and we'll do an audit and run some software on a network, uh, we'll come up with half the machines are missing a significant and more a number of patches and updates. And it leaves those computers vulnerable. You should think about security very much like your house. You probably wouldn't leave your home with windows open or doors unlocked. Um, every desktop, laptop, or mobile device at the company that's left insecure is vulnerable to that kind of an attack. Uh, so that's very important. Firmware updates are usually software updates that are applied to the hardware. Uh, firmware updates are very common for routers and switches, even motherboards. Uh, the Intel problems of late with uh, the uh, meltdown and Spectre uh, vulnerabilities are rather important. Uh, firmware updates have to be applied to address those. Uh, I think it's important to have antivirus and anti-malware on the computers. These protect against different things. They both have to be there. Happily, they don't fight with each other. Uh, never, ever have two antivirus products on the same computer because they often identify each other as an antivirus and kill the performance of the computer. But you want to have antivirus, anti-malware. I often think what you pay for these is close to the value. So if you're using something that's free, uh, expect that's probably the value of what it's doing for you. Uh, competent, uh, secure, security-minded software professionals cost money. Uh, they don't usually work for free. So if you're paying nothing for your antivirus, it's probably worth that. Uh, Two-factor authentication is becoming increasingly important. By two-factor authentication, we mean something that you have with you at all times, meaning that your username and password, someone could find out and go log in, but if they don't have that thing you carry with you, they can't. So some examples of two-factor authentication, we are used to uh, fingerprint scanners that we've had for years. Uh, you always carry your fingers with you. Um, there are uh, token devices that have a number that's constantly changing. It's in sequence with something else on the server. And uh, when you go to authenticate, you put in your username and password and it asks you for the code that that token device is showing at that very moment. Um, another way of doing two-factor authentication, uh, I see a lot of websites doing where when you attempt to log in, they'll send a code to your phone, knowing that ideally no one has your phone but you, and you put in the code that came on your phone. And uh, these are just dramatically more secure than not having them. But a lot of companies uh, don't want to do that. Oh, this is inconvenient. Well, sec real security is that balance between being secure and tolerating the inconvenience. Um, also, uh, the last bullet, individual and unique user credentials. Um, I tend to believe everyone needs a unique login, username, and password. Uh, I hate it when I see organizations that you'll have a team, uh, maybe it's front desk, uh, and they're all logging in at the same time. The reason this is so absolutely horrible is if somebody does something bad, let's say it's Sally, we'll blame Sally. Um, we don't know that Sally did it. All we know is somebody who's in the group front desk went and did this bad thing. So unique user credentials are crucial. In fact, uh, many of the uh, compliance regulations like HIPAA, PCI, things like that, um, if you don't have unique credentials for each person, you fail the uh, compliance test. So anyway, number seven, checking the perimeter security. Um, the, traditionally, everybody went to work at the same building, and you'd have a firewall, and that firewall segregated the outside world from the inside corporate world. Uh, we still see that at, at some companies, but in, for better or for worse, we're seeing increasing companies where a uh, organization is disparately located around the world. Uh, people may be working from home. In those cases, we'll come up with kind of a virtual perimeter security. Uh, traditionally, we're talking about a firewall. Um, and when we're talking about a virtual uh, perimeter security uh, for people who are disparately located, we might put a firewall in the cloud 
and then we program all the user computers to go through that firewall in the cloud before they access the rest of the internet. That way we can in, uh, insist on certain security settings and, and protect those people. Regardless of whether the firewall is on the premise or in the cloud, we're trying to do the same thing protect the people on the inside and make sure that we minimize risks for attack. In your documentation, you want to be recording each firewall, its name, its role, uh, when it was deployed. Um, not all firewalls are running advanced security services like antivirus, anti-malware. If they are, you want to be recording that. Uh, today, we even have more advanced security settings, uh, maybe like cloud-based sandboxing. Uh, you want to record if that's happening. You need to record which ports are open versus closed. Uh, what are the rules? Um, you know, where do you stand on firmware updates? What updates are you not deploying? Why aren't you deploying them? You want to include the admin credentials. And if I haven't stressed this before, you must not use default. Um, almost all devices, there are websites we can go to to look up what's the default credentials for a network, Netgear router. Um, you never, ever want to have use, use the defaults. Immediately change them upon getting them, but, but log it and write it down. And similarly, like everything else we've talked about, what are the support agreements for this firewall? Uh, like a server, I don't like to have any firewalls out there that are not under a support agreement and that I'm getting updates for uh, to help keep an environment secure. Data backups and business continuity, high, highly uh, related to each other. Um, we wanna define a plan. What's our plan for backing up our data? Um, I get really frustrated when people put all their data in the cloud and nothing on site, particularly when they're using one of those inexpensive consumer-based cloud backup products. Uh, that could require many hours to days to have even seen weeks before you would get all the data back. Uh, in the event of a disaster, you've got to have fast access to your data. So what's our plan? How are we going to back things up? What's our strategy? Where's the data being stored? Is it on-site? Is it off-site? Hopefully it's both. And how quickly can I do a number of crucial tasks all around this area? How, how long does it take me to do a file or directory restore? How long does it take me to do a single server restore and get it back in operation? Similarly, if the entire building were obliterated, where all this is, uh, how long would it take me to restore the company? These things have to be thought about. Similarly, we keep doing support agreements again and again. Um, I don't like to use backup tools that I don't have a support agreement. Um, problems happen. You've got to be able to get help. And often you need the help when the stuff hits the fan. Um, is there a written disaster recovery plan? Again, this can become a task unto itself. It is, disaster recovery plans are gargantuan. But just documenting the step eight on backups and business continuity is a really good start to developing a disaster recovery plan. And of course, if you have one, when was it last tested? Um, I like to test them periodically. In fact, most of our clients, uh, we test their backups nightly just to make sure that they really operate. Key takeaways from all of this. Um, documentation is imperative for you to understand what's working well in your systems and to identify where the problems are. Uh, Network security is necessary to protect your data from the hackers, but not understanding how things are laid out uh, could really mess you up. You could miss a whole aspect of your network that is insecure and you might not take care of it. You need to always have a backup plan in place. I'm sorry, you gotta, and you gotta test it. And frankly, you should be testing kind of the way we did the speed tests on the internet connection, you periodically want to do test restores of files, folders, and devices to see how long that's going to take. You need to monitor the health of your system. Uh, we like to monitor our clients, all their devices 24 seven, and then have alerts be thrown at us when anything is out of skew. Um, 
you need to understand spyware, how it works. Uh, there are a lot of websites that I read nightly. Um, as soon as I get home, I pull them up and I start reading about what happened today. What do I need to do tomorrow to protect my clients? Um, know your endpoint security. Uh, really focus on those patches and having the security programs on each device to protect you. And check your internet connection, what's going on. And some of the advanced things related to checking your internet connection is, what's the data that's flowing through here? Are we okay with what's coming in? Are we okay with what's going out? If you don't have advanced tools, look into those things you don't know. Now, this is the final slide of the whole webinar, and I'm gonna leave it up for a while because there's some important things on here. We understand that audits can be difficult. And if you need our help, you could reach out to us. Um, I've already published on the website the Network Audit blog, and there's the address there in green. So you can go there and get that. If you're finding yourself frustrated configuring your own IT audit, contact us. You could email us at info, info at Sagason Technologies, or excuse me, info at sagason.com, uh, or just go to my website and click on the Contact Us link. Um, if you'd like a complimentary network assessment, I should say assessment because assessments are different to me than audits, um, we can talk about that. You can go fill out the information and reach out to me and I'll talk to you about it. We are commonly hired by IT people to come in and help them with these audits. We're always glad to do it. Anyway, at this point, I'm going to switch over and see if I've got any questions. And I see my assistant Nikki has no questions yet. Interesting. Ah, there's a question. How long does an audit take? Um, it really depends on the environment. Um, so to, here's the, to me an assessment is kind of a walk around, look at things. I can usually assess an environment in under an hour. An audit could take some time. Uh, small business, five, 10 people, probably a couple hours. Um, the more people you get that time goes up dramatically, the more servers. Uh, I was at a mid-market company um, a couple weeks ago for a meeting, and they had 30 servers and several locations. And my quote to them was, I was going to need a month. Um, they had over 100 people, uh, servers all over the place. It was going to take quite uh, an amount of work. So I hope that answers your questions, how long an audit will take. It varies. Feel free to type in your questions if you've got them. I'm, I'm watching the uh, information here. Okay, well, I'm not, oh, there's one last one. I have an IT guy, but he does not currently do th this for us. But will, uh, but will the guide be helpful for him uh, or should you go, go to, or should we go to you? Um, that's always a delicate question. Um, here's the truth. Uh, if your IT guy doesn't know how to do this stuff, um, he's going to be starting with this. And certainly looking at the guide we have here is a good starting place. It might be more efficient uh, for us to work with him and help him do his first audit. Uh, again, we're commonly called in to to do audits very often with IT people. So we're kind of teaching them how to do it in the long run but there's different ways to go. Um, I was just contacted yesterday by a company that's gotten ransomware two times in the last couple of months, and they are done with their current IT person and wanted us to come out. So it depends on the company. You know, If you're exhausted with your IT person, uh, we're happy to help. If you're an IT person who wants the help, it's often smarter to bring us in to help you so that you continue to look good. Anyway, just being honest. Uh, do you work with small companies or just large? Um, I prefer businesses of 20 employees to 200, but in all honesty, I have companies uh, with single individuals who are highly concerned about security and business continuity and being compliant. And our two largest clients are both over 500 employees each and located with offices in multiple countries. So we run the gamut. <laughs> Anyway, 
uh, unless I get any more uh, questions, what I'm going to say is if a question should occur to you, feel free to email me at info at Sagacent, and I'll do my best to respond. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed today's webinar. I certainly did. And uh, hope you look for our, our future webinars. Have a great day. Bye-bye.